Kenya's Supreme Court is expected to decide on Monday whether to uphold or nullify the results of last month's presidential election. The seven-member court will rule following three days of oral arguments last week. Opposition leader Raila Odinga, who made his fifth presidential bid, says that Deputy President William Ruto's narrow win is a product of massive fraud. Four out of seven of the election commissioners disown the results announced by the commission chairperson, saying that the tallying had not been transparent. In the 2017 election, the Supreme Court made history by annulling President Uhuru Kenyatta's victory at the time over Odinga because of procedural irregularities. Kenyatta, though, prevailed in a rerun that Odinga boycotted. About 100 people were killed in election-related clashes that year. Well, for more on this, we're now joined via Zoom by Lebohang Peg, who is a senior research fellow at uh, the Trade Collective. Uh, Lebohang, always good to talk to you. Thanks so much indeed uh, for joining us. Thank you so much. All right, so big day tomorrow if uh, the uh, Supreme Court does actually make its decision as expected. Um, and there's been this narrative about fears of uh, post-election violence in Kenya. I think I've heard you talk about it before. I just wonder what your thoughts are this time around. Uh, one gets a sense that things are not the same as they were in the past. So the interesting thing about this, I think we've, we're, we're, when we've spoken previously, um, we've spoken about a few things. And the one is this, um, the, the use of the courts to deal with um, electoral outcomes um, and the, the ju judicialization of election processes and of election results, which I think poses its own interesting dilemmas and complexities, particularly in the context of a con of, 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 of contexts where we are supposed to be upholding the rule of law uh, and where it's expected that all of the incumbents will also have some respect for that. And I, and, and I think there's a strong distinction between the clearly stolen elections and the, there will often be a, a margin of error, particularly on many, you know, many elections on, on the continent now and again. But one of the things that's quite ironic about this is that Mr. Odinga himself has been one of the champions for democratization, whatever that may or may not mean in this regard, and, and also for the, the, a lot of the constitutional reforms. What is one of the interesting and useful things is, is also that the, the, the Kenyan, the Kenyan um, court system, legal system, has historically been extremely robust, very independent. They refused to kowtow in the previous elections when Mr. Odinga's camp wanted to rule, wanted them to rule on election results even before all of the counts had actually come in. And then the other pieces that are even in um, earlier this year, when Mr. Odinga and Mr. Kenyatta wanted to some constitutional reforms, possibly to sway the, the outcomes, I don't know. Um, again, the Kenyan, um, the Kenyan courts refused. So I think that the, the good thing is that there's a lot of robustness, but it does call into question whether or not it is the role of, 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 of courts to, to, take, to take the accountability and the process of selection essentially out of the hands of the populace. Mm. I suppose when there's a history, as we saw in 2017, of procedural errors, uh, and at that time the uh, Electoral Commission uh, was pointed to by the, uh, uh, the courts, then it must be some other authority beyond the electoral process that has to decide, and maybe this is why we're here. Maybe it is why we're here, but I mean, you know, if we if we feel as though, it, I think it calls into the into question, Peter and the viewers, um, the tenets of so-called liberal democracy, and this is where I think liberal democracy as an idea has its limitations because ultimately it relies on the goodwill, the largesse, the maturity and the inclination of all involved to buy into this into this contract so liberal liberal democracy is um is is, is the assumption that everybody in society has a, shares a platform a value system of pla a, a, around governance and how this governance and how this power is transacted and that you know the electoral process is about managing this transaction of power between different incumbents from one term to the next but also that it gives the electorate themselves the opportunity to to transact and to, to, to pronounce 
on whom they would want um, this, whose power they want to be, whose hands they want to be in, who should have this power. And I think that what this does is that it takes away the perspective that the people who ultimately should have the most power are the electoral, you know, the electorate themselves. And I think that the veiled threats, for lack of a, for, which, which frankly, that I don't think there's any other way to put it, that have been made um, around by some camps that. If the if the courts don't rule in their favor, um, if once if one result is the one that emerges tomorrow, this will lead to violence. Other than seeming as though it is really stoking up some kind of um, you know trying to stoke and anticipate a mood, a particular kind of ambiance in the country, it does also call into question then um, why it is then if there was such outrage um, at the, at, after the electoral results, why that would not have spontaneously combusted before this time so you get a sense uh, I'm, I'm reading that you believe that this time around uh, it, it's a different tone uh, around these elections uh, that it's we shouldn't be immediately thinking violence if the result doesn't go one way or another I don't, I don't think we should. And I actually think that it's unfair on the Kenyan electorate, um, on, the, on, the, on the many people who are vested in this process. Um, I think it's also on, it, it also feeds into, a, into a, a very narrow kind of reporting, a very narrow kind of analysis um, that all elections, on, on, you know, especially Kenyan elections, have been violent. And that's just simply not true. The last two were certainly mired by particular incidences, but that would not be said to be um, par for the course. Uh, and I think that you know we should we should be very careful the sort of stereotyping or the sort of characterizations that we 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 are portioned to to the Kenyan electoral system per se. And also when we speak about post electoral violence, I mean, I don't we've, have we ever seen anything as chaotic as what happened last year in the U.S. Um, you know, in, in January the sixth last year so i think that this it's also important not to pathologize ourselves as a people as a continent per se um as well but i think that this also i do think that there are deeper concerns around the merits the demerits the the, the elasticity and how we are able to form liberal democracy on this continent in a manner that's not just tick box but that's substantive that many millions of kenyan voting age kenyan stayed away from the electoral processes is in itself an act of um an, an act of of, of, of 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 protest in some in, in some regard the lack of interest we can call it a lack of interest apathy um whatever it is but that in and of itself speaks volumes and i think rather than you know in it other than only being concerned about the numbers of people who may have put their, their, their exes in the ballot box, all parties, all political parties should ask themselves, why is it that our messaging and our preposition, our manifestos were so unappealing or so unconvincing that millions of people were, co were not compelled to participate in any way? And that's a question for both the, whatever, the incumbent, the opposition, that, that, that really should be asked at the time like this. The voter turnout was lower than even in 2017. Um, and, and I think especially given that this was a, a, a pivotal electoral process for the Kenyan government, for the Kenyan people, where we see this passing of the guard that's certainly taking place. Why were this, why, why the apathy? Why the disinterest? These are much more important questions right now that I think any political party needs to ask themselves. Why are they so unconvincing? Why are people so disinterested in fact, in what they have to say um, as a political preposition. You say passing of the guard, changing of the guard, but I guess in many respects it isn't really though, is it? Particularly when you consider Odinga's dynasty and that Ruto has been part That's of it. this government structure for decades. He's been part of the government structure. Um, Bruto comes directly from Kanu, Kanu youth, as we know, mm -hmm. in the um, in the late 80s as well, um, 90s, under the, the heavy pupillage and tutelage of late President Arab Moy, um, also share a particular, they, they share an ethnicity, which unfortunately means quite a lot still in, um, in Kenyan politics. So there's really nothing very fresh in any of this. And I think we've spoken a, a, again around how difficult it is to, 
adjudicate or to think through what it means to have a new political compact, a new deal, especially in a context where the interests are largely class interests and where this is really a reconfiguration and a reconsolidation of those interests. So even though we don't have an ethnic, we don't have the same ethnic lines, the same narrow ethnicity, certainly you know, money and money interests and class land interests seem to be the new currency. And what is very worrying about that is that it's even more difficult to to remove that kind of architecture. It's in order to, to in order to even enter the frame of Kenyan politics, it does seem as though now um, it is about really be, uh, being part of and building the architecture of this narrow oligarchy. So even though Mr. Ruto or Dr. Ruto has fashioned himself as a man of the people, the hustler, um, the, the man who used to sell chickens, he's now the third, you know, the, the third largest landowner, one of the third largest farmers in the country as well. So you can see that even, even, even the rhetoric of being a person of the people is far outweighed by, you know, very clear class, very, very narrow class interest. And I think what's really particularly disturbing about this is that in all of this, the, 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 the electorate themselves, I don't think have been given the opportunity for even the manifestos to really ventilate, to be given life, to be articulated. There's such a strong alignment between not only ethno, ethno nationalism, but also deep personality politics. So it looks like even now, the orange, uh, the ODM, the orange movement that Mr. Raila Odinga has been at the helm of since at least 2007 or 2006, it will probably die without him um and 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 and, and you know even a, a minute a person and the in the, like mr late president kibaki who came in on a kanu ticket and then and, you know the next election he was on he was on an, i'm sorry on the narc ticket this na this national rainbow coalition and then he then came on on a different ticket for his subsequent electoral ele electoral outing i mean even where party politics, party political vehicles themselves are so disposable, it's 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 fascinating, but it also begs the question: What is the anchor? What is the what is the actual landing ground for a political for the polity to take place, for ideas to be to be to be interrogated and wrestled with and shaped when even the vehicles themselves seem incredibly disposable? All right. So perhaps finally. Um what might be the significance of tomorrow's results one way or the other? Remains to be seen. We, 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 we remains to be seen. I think we, 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 which it is looking as though, I wouldn't want to call it, but one thing that seems quite clear on the ground, um, and I've been sort of staying in touch with folks in, in Kenya um, fairly regularly, is that the mood this time in 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 in, the, in in for you know the mood in the context of Mr. Odinga's own assertions that you know we was robbed once again are really not as um, don't really have the same currency. I mean, I think I, I read one report where they said that he has used the the kitchen sink, the everything except the kitchen sink um, approach, including uh, carrying ballot boxes, supposedly cheap, supposedly um, doctored ballot boxes into the court rooms, all sorts of things. Um, and look, far be it for, for anybody to, to, to protest his, his right to robustly contest. But I do certainly think that what, what will happen tomorrow should be a show of force that shows that, number one, the electorate must not be taken for granted in this way. Secondly, that you know election results, especially those which have been held in what seemed to be an almost cheat-proof environment. There's no such a thing as cheat-proof entirely, but what seemed to be an almost cheat-proof environment at great cost to the Kenyan fiscus as well. I think that that's the other thing that there needs to be a level of sensitivity about how much these elections actually cost. And I think lastly, how do we want then to how do we want to continue as a, as a, across the across the, the region across the continent what are the sorts of architecture that we want to put in place to ensure that our electoral systems are seen to be sacrosanct um, to ensure that they, that we see we have election commissions which are seen to be independent and robust and that when the when, when in fact there are disputes the legal system 
um, should not be the, the, the should not be the recourse of a first resort, and that seems to be uh, a, a growing trend. Um, and I think that again to say that the. The, the use of the legal system and of court of the court system to solve what should ex essentially be executive processes and democratic processes as a, a, instead of leaning on the checks and balances that already exist within many of our of, of our polity is is something that I hope tomorrow will be found will be ruled on very significantly and very forcefully and may the best candidate win. Hang, always great talking to you. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Your insights, greatly appreciated.